Welcome to lecture 14, where we will do still a little bit more work on Carnot maps. Uh, in lecture 13, we saw the use, uh, of our first example of the use of Carnot maps to find all minimal products of a function. And uh, let's look at another example of that. So, if you have the textbook for the course, this is problem 5.4, part C. Uh, we have the function f of a, b, c, d. is equal to b, d prime. or B prime CD or ABC or ABC prime D or B prime D prime. And we want to find all minimal products. Now, as soon as you see that we want to find all minimal products, that means that we're going to be looking for groupings of zeros rather than for groupings of ones on the Carnot map. But at the same time, you should realize that this function, since it is expressed uh, here, this is a sum of products expression. And so each one of those products will correspond to one or more one cells in the Carnot map. So this is a little bit of a challenge. One thing that you could do is to rewrite this as a product of sums, and then each one of those sums would correspond to one or more zero cells in the kernel map, and so you could uh, approach the problem in that way by, uh, first of all, writing this as a POS expression and then filling in the zeros on the kernel map. But uh, I think that the easiest thing to do is to just go ahead and uh, draw two Carnot maps. Of course, it's the same Carnot map, but we'll be stressing different things. And so what I mean exactly is the following. We'll start, uh, as, as usual, we, we notice that if, uh, uh, well, we note the number of independent variables for this function, which is 4, and 2 to the 4th is 16, so we'll have a Carnot map with 16 cells, arranged in a 4x4 four four fashion. And in this first kernel map for this function, I'm going to look directly at this expression that is given and fill in the 1 cells. And then once I have the kernel map with the 1 cells, it will be, of course, uh, extremely easy to find the kernel map with the zero cells and then once I have the kernel map with the zero cells then I will proceed to find all minimal products. So um, as usual now with the kernel map problem we will put the first two independent variables on the vertical axis and the last two uh, independent variables on the horizontal axis and then label this in the usual way. And now let's go through uh, each one of these product terms and find out exactly how it should be filled in on the Carnot map. Now before I go any further, um, I've already 
told you what I think would be a good strategy to take for this problem. And so I really very strongly encourage you to stop the video at this point and to try to finish this problem on your own and then check and see if you get the same answer. And uh, when we all, uh, when you when you resume the, the video. Okay, so um, having said that now, let's go ahead and uh, tackle this problem. Uh, we first look at the term B D prime. Now the cells that we, we want to fill in on the kernel map, all cells that are equal to one when that term is equal to one. Now this term will be equal to one under two conditions. B, well, it's actually a simultaneous condition, I guess this you say. We must have B equals one, and we must have D equals zero. Well, B equals one corresponds to the middle two rows of the kernel map, and D equals zero corresponds to the first column and the last column. So the first term, BD prime, will correspond to these four one cells. Once again, those are the only cells in the kernel map where we have both B equals 1 and D equals 0. Now let's look at the next term, B prime CD. Well, uh, we can reason as follows. Since the term CD is part of this, we know immediately then that we're going to be in this third column where C and D are both equal to 1. And we also want B to be 0. And that's the case in the first row and also in the last row. So this time we get two ones. Notice from the expression that had two variables, we got four one cells. From this longer expression that has three variables in it, we get two one cells. And so this is consistent with what we've said several times before, that the more literals you have in the term, the fewer one cells you'll get in the kernel map, and vice versa. So that takes care of the B prime CD term. Now what about ABC? Well, uh, we want A and B to both equal 1, and so that tells you immediately that you'll be in the third row. And we also want C to be equal to 1, and C is equal to 1 in the last two columns, here and here. So we want to fill in a 1 here, and now we would also get a 1 here, but it's already a 1, so we can just leave it. There's uh, nothing else that needs to be done. Now let's look at A, B, C prime D. Now this is a term with uh, four literals in it, so it will correspond to only one cell in the Carnot map. And it's the cell where A is one, B is one, C is zero, and D is one. So if A and B are both one, that tells us we're in the third row. C is zero and D is one, tells us that we're in this second column. And so we fill in that square or that uh, cell there. And uh, finally we have the B prime D prime term. So this will correspond to all cells where both B is 0 and D is 0. B is 0 on the first row and the last row. And D is 0 on the first column and the last column. So we have one, two, three, four ones there. Again, the four corners are where both B is zero and D is zero. So this is the Carnot map for this function. But uh, the only difficulty is that we want to find all minimal products. And when you're looking for minimal products, uh, you want to look at zero cells, groupings of zero cells, rather than groupings of one cells. So we want to have the same Carnot map, but just with the zero cells emphasized, rather than the one cells. And so, a uh, completely equivalent way of drawing this Carnot map is the following.
Now we just need to put in zeros wherever we have blanks on the uh, kernel map on the left. So we have zero, 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 and zero here as well. And these are exactly the same kernel map. It's just that in one we show the one cells and in the other we show the zero cells. So now that we have the kernel map showing the zero cells, we're ready to go ahead and solve this problem. And uh, we want to find minimal, all minimal products. So our first task is to find all prime implicates. And uh, there are only four zeros here. So certainly there's no grouping of 16 zeros. Certainly there's no grouping of eight zeros. And uh, there, there's no rectangular grouping of four zeros. So we go all the way down now to two. And there are uh, several groupings of two zeros. The one that's uh, the trickiest to do is this one, where we group these two zero cells together. And um, let's think about, let's go ahead, I'll draw as usual a rough sketch of that. And now let's think about the name of it. Uh, you see that A is equal to zero on the top row and one on the bottom row. So since A is changing, it will not appear in the name. But B is zero on both rows. So we get a B in the name of this prime implicate. And um, that will be ORed. Well, we see that C is constant and equal to zero in this column. D is constant and equal to one in this column. So we get B or C or D prime. Once again, uh, we're looking now for minimal products, and so the terms, these prime implicates, are named acor um, according to when they're equal to zero, and uh, that will happen. Uh, we'll get this prime implicate. Uh, this one corresponds to B is equal to zero, and C is equal to zero, and D is equal to one. So that's one, and now another grouping of two zero cells is clearly here. And if you had trouble naming the previous prime implicate, uh, try to uh, take a moment, maybe stop the video for just a moment, and try to name this one. Okay, on this one what we notice is that A is constant and equal to zero, so we get A ORD with, uh, now B is changing in these two rows, so it does not appear in the name. And the CD part will be just as it was before because we're still in the second column. So since C is zero and D is one, we will get C and uh, D prime. And now there is one more grouping, a rectangular grouping of two zero cells, and it's this one. And uh, try to name that one, try to think of what the name would be. And if you do, I think that you will conclude that uh, A is constant equal to zero, so we get A. B is constant equal to one, so we will get B prime. Uh, now C is changing, but D is constant and equal to one, so we get D prime. So those are the essential prime implicates of size two. And I don't believe that there are any more of those. And then if we drop down to size one, we see that there are no prime implicates of size one that are not already completely contained within one of the prime implicates we've already identified. And so therefore, this is it. We just have three prime implicates for this problem. Each uh, has two zero cells in it. And so now, our next 
task is to find essential prime implicates. Okay, so um, as I was saying, now that we have identified all the prime implicates, we would next like to identify all the essential prime implicates. And the first step in doing that is to identify all of the essential zero cells. As we look up here at the kernel map, we can clearly see that this zero at the top in the top row is not essential because it's contained to, within two prime implicates, uh, nor is this one essential, but this one is contained only within one prime implicate, so it is essential, and likewise, this one is essential as well. So that's a complete listing of all of the essential zero cells, and now let's look at the essential prime implicates. So we'll just go through each one of our prime implicates and see whether or not each one is essential. This first one, B or C or D prime, notice that uh, it, it is the one consisting of this uh, zero cell at the bottom and the zero cell at the top. And this zero cell at the bottom is essential and therefore B or C or D prime is essential. Uh, a or C or D prime is the two cells here at the top of the second column and neither one of those is essential and therefore A or C or D prime is not essential. What about A or B prime or D prime? Well, uh, it is the two middle cells here in the second row and one of those is essential and that's all it takes is just one and therefore a or b prime or d prime is essential so our two essential prime implicates are b or c or d prime and a or b prime or d prime and now uh, if we list all minimal products well uh, remember that every single product that we have must contain the essential prime implicates so we'll start with F of A B I guess it was uh, not that it matters much but it's capital F so capital F of A, B, C, D is equal to, and as I said, we have to uh, have to include what's essential, so we might as well start with that. B or C or D prime ended with A or B prime or D prime. And now we uh, go and shade in those two terms on the kernel map and see if we need to account for anything else. So the uh, B or C or D prime, as we can see from our little sketch here, that takes care of this zero at the top of the second column and the zero at the bottom of the second column. And the uh, other term A or B prime or D prime, uh, as we can see from this sketch, that takes care of the two cells in the middle of the second row. So we can shade in these two cells. And now we ask ourselves if there are any other unaccounted for cells. And the answer is no. And therefore we're done. Uh, this is the only minimal product for this function. And so that would be your final answer in this case. And um, just to summarize, this procedure is very similar uh, to the procedure for finding all minimal sums uh, of a function. I believe that the only thing that's a little tricky here is the naming of the prime implicates. So that completes uh, this part of our discussion of Carnot maps. We have now seen how to use Carnot maps 
to find all minimal sums and all minimal products of a function. And now we want to go to a new topic. This new topic is called don't care conditions. And um, let's look at an example of where a don't care condition might arise. Uh, let's suppose, let's just take a very simple example. Let's suppose that uh, f of x, y is equal to f1 of x, y ended with f2 of x, y. Furthermore, let's suppose that um, the truth tables for f2 of x, y and f of x, y are as follows. Okay, so here's our truth tables for f2 of xy and f of xy. And now the question that we pose is, what is the truth table for f1 of xy? So I'll put this over here to the right. And let's look at each one of these four cases. Okay. Now, in the first case, when x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0, f2 is equal to 1 and f is equal to 1. Now, f is equal to f1 ended with f2. And in this case, f2 is 1 and f is 1. So you see that in this case, there's only one possibility for f1, and it is that f1 is equal to 1. How do we know this? Well, if f1 were equal to 0, remember 0 ended with anything is 0. So if f1 were equal to 0 in this first row, then 0 ended with f2, remember is equal to 1, but 0 ended with 1 would be 0, so f itself would be 0, but we know that f is equal to 1 in the first row of the truth table, and therefore f1 must be 1. What about in the next row? Well, in the next row of the truth table, we know that f2 is 0 and f is 0. And you see now our very first situation when we're going to have what's called a don't care condition. We denote that as a D. In other words, we really don't care what is chosen for f1 in this position because whether we choose f1 to be 0 or we choose f1 to be equal to 1, in either case, we will get uh, the rest of the truth table to be true. That is, because f2 is 0, 
that guarantees that f will be 0, regardless of the value of f1. So when x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 1, we have a don't care condition for f1. In other words, its value is indeterminate. We don't know what it's equal to. Okay, let's look at the next case. In the third row of the truth table, we see that f is equal to 0, but f2 is equal to 1. Well, what does this tell us that f1 is equal to? f1 must be equal to 0. Because if f1 were equal to 1, we would have 1 ended with 1, and therefore f would have to be 1, but f is 0. And therefore the fact that f is 0 and f2 is 1 tells us f1 must be 0. And finally, in the last row, we have f2 is 0 and f is 0, and this is just like the second row, since f2 is 0, that alone guarantees that f will be 0 regardless of the value of f1. So we have a don't care condition there for f1 as well. So don't care condition just corresponds to a situation in which the value of a function is indeterminate and, uh, you know, for the purposes that you have, you don't care what value of f is used. Let's look now at another example of a function with don't care conditions. And by the way, I see uh, that your book, uh, in a truth table, rather than using d's, your book is using x's to denote don't care conditions. Now in the uh, um, decimal notation, they do use d for that. Uh, which we'll see in just a moment, but in the truth table itself they're using an X. So for instance, uh, here, just to be consistent with the notation in your book, instead of a D there and a D here, we'll put two X's, but then if your book were going to write the function F1 in uh, decimal notation, it would say F1 of XY is equal to the sum of the min term uh, zero, so it's just m zero. Plus d of uh, one and three, and what that's saying is that uh, for the for one, in other words, for x equals zero and y equals one, or for three when x equals 1 and y equals 1. For either of those two conditions, we have a don't care condition for f, as, you, as is denoted here in the truth table by x's. But in the 0, 0 condition, we do have a 1, so that's, a min, that's min term 0. So this is the way, uh, this is the way that your, the notation that your book is using. So we might as well uh, stick with that here in the lecture. So now we'll look at another example. We'll say, um, find the min term expansion for G of X, Y, Z. Well, let's maybe say ABC. G of A, B, C in uh, decimal notation. If G is given by A B C G of A B C and we'll have the following truth table
let's suppose that the truth table for G were as follows. Then the midterm expansion for G in decimal notation would be as follows. We simply have G of ABC is equal to the sum of the min terms. Okay, we don't have zero, but we do have one, and we also have five and seven. But then we have don't care conditions for two and four. So this would be the decimal notation for that function. Actually, I see now that I need to make one more change, one final change to be consistent with the notation in your book, and that is to denote that uh, we have a sum of those don't care conditions. So this should be the sum of D 1 and 3. And likewise, this should be the sum down here of D2 and 4. So when you're writing a midterm expansion, which of course is a sum, you'll write your don't care conditions as a sum. And likewise, as you'll see in some of our other problems, when you have don't care conditions uh, for a, a max term expansion, then you'll write it as um, a product. Now that we've said that, let's uh, look at a related question. I mean, so far all we're doing is just identifying don't care conditions, but now we come to an interesting question, and uh, this is similar to some of the questions that are asked in, at the end of Unit 4 in your book and uh, it goes as follows. Find the simplest expression for uh, G. I'll, I'll uh, put it like this. Find the simplest um, SOP. So the simplest sum of products expression for G of ABC and identify the values used for the don't care conditions. Now, what does the book mean when it asks a question like this? Well, we have a function g, which is a function of the independent variables a, b, and c. And for, uh, you know, the, the, those three Boolean variables have altogether eight possible combinations of values, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on, all the way down to 1, 1, 1. Now, for six of those combinations, we have a given specified value for G. But for two of those combinations, we really don't care what value we have for G. So that means that we have some freedom in choosing what values G will assume for those particular combinations of the variables. And the book is asking us, or we are challenged in this particular problem, which isn't straight out of the book, but it's similar to some of the problems in the book, we're challenged in this problem to choose those two values in such a way that we get the simplest possible expression for uh, G. So let me write that down. In other words, choose the values of the don't care conditions so that uh, you 
obtain the simplest SOP expression for G. Well, as we have mentioned before, when you use purely algebraic methods to try to simplify a function, it can be unreliable because sometimes there will be simplifications that you just don't see. The only reliable way to simplify a function, especially if it's a more complicated function, is to use the kernel map. So let's see how that would go in a problem like this. Well, uh, looking at the truth table, and uh, actually the formula for G is sufficient, so let's just repeat that formula down here. We have G of A, B, C is equal to the sum of the min terms 1, 5, and 7 plus the sum of the don't care conditions 2 and 4. So if we think about this, uh, it, let's think about the kernel map for G. We put the first variable on the vertical axis and the second and third variable on the horizontal axis. Now we know that in cells 1, 5, and 7 we must have 1's. So here is, remember we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So we know that the function g has 1's in those three cells. But in cells 2 and 4, uh, we, don't, we don't care what value g has. Now recall again, uh, 2 is this cell and 4 is this cell. So uh, the way that you can think about this is the following. One way that you could uh, look at this is to say that G has four possibilities. Uh, in other words, one possibility for G would be when cells 2 and 4 both have zeros. Another possibility would be this. We have 1, 5, and 7 would get 1's, but now we must also have a 1, uh, for instance, in, in the uh, 4 position. So we'll have this, but still a 0 in the 2 position. And then another possibility Again, we have to have ones in the 1, 5, and 7 position, but this time let's suppose we have a 1 in the cell corresponding to 2 and a nothing in the cell corresponding to 4. And then a final possibility would be that we have again 1 in cells 1, 5, and 7, and now a 1 in both cell 2 and in cell 4. It's important that you realize that any one of these kernel maps is an acceptable kernel map for this function g because we don't care what value g has 
in cell 2 or in cell 4. So any one of these kernel maps is uh, acceptable and uh, therefore if we want to find the simplest expression for G we need to look at each one of these and see which yields the simplest expression. So uh, this gives you four quick opportunities to practice with the Carnot map and I um, strongly suggest that you do that and uh, then we'll come back and look at this problem together. Okay, so for the make a work area for each one of these functions these should all be pretty quick. So for the prime applicants of this first function obviously we are not going to have any groupings of 8 or 4 so we go down to groupings of 2 and we see two of those. We see this one and this one and um, so I'll draw a sketch of those two and uh, we see that this first one is B complement C and the second one here is A C now when we look for essential prime implicate implicants we uh, see that this is essential and this is essential and since each prime implicant has an essential one cell in it both prime implicants are essential so we have B prime C and A C are our essential prime implicants and therefore uh, the list of all minimal sums for G in this case is simply B prime C or A C and uh, uh, we can see that uh, that would indeed count for everything so that's it and this expression has four literals now let's go to uh, this possibility well, even though we have four one cells in this case, there are no rectangular groupings of, of uh, four one cells. So we look for rectangular groupings of two one cells, and we see one, two, three of them. And um, if we identify each one of those, Uh, this first one in the lower left hand corner oh, well, this, remember to number this and uh, the first one in the lower left hand corner we have A B complement in the uh, the next prime implicant which is the two cells here on the bottom row, the middle two cells on the bottom row, we have A, C, and, and notice that that's the same as before over here, and then these two, this has already been identified before, this is B prime C. Now if you look for the essential prime implicants, you'll see that this is essential, this is essential, and this is essential. So each one of those prime implicants has an essential one cell and therefore in this case we must include all of those. We have A, B prime or A, C or B prime C that's our expression for G in this case and here we have six literals so that certainly is not as simple as the first one we obtained 
and therefore you might expect right away that we don't want that and in fact I think you can look ahead and see that this one even without doing it this is going to have an extra term here and likewise this one will have even more terms than the second one so in this case uh, for this problem we want to choose this first option where we actually assigned uh, zeros to both cells 2 and 4 In other words, we will use as the as the best option, we will use the following. Now we look up above and remember that in 1, 5, and 7, this is what's the case up here, 1, 5, and 7, in fact everything uh, that we're given up here in this truth table must be the same except that we can now, uh, we have values for these two um, don't care conditions. And so we end up in this case, since we found out that it's, in, it's best in this case to use 0 for both of those, then our final truth table would be okay here's one here's five and here's seven and everything else is zero now you might look at this example and you, you if you're hasty if you're not thinking carefully you might think to yourself that well of course uh, if we're finding trying to find the simplest uh, sum expression that will be the one where we have the fewest ones and so for both of these don't care conditions we should choose zero but if you reason like that you would be misled and so um, let's look at another example and we'll make this one a little quicker suppose uh, H of ABC is and uh, this time we'll have the following Okay, so here is a, a function with just one don't care condition. And if we wrote the decimal notation for it, we would have H of A, B, C is equal to the sum of the min terms um, 1, 5, and 7. Plus, uh, and if it, since it's only one don't care condition, it doesn't really have to be a sum. But if you want to use a sum, that's fine. Uh, the sum of the single don't care condition, uh, three. So that would be uh, one way of writing this decimal notation. And now again, let's say that we choose the value for the don't care condition.
that will yield the simplest SOP expression for H. Okay, so in this case uh, we'll proceed just as we did before but since there's only one don't care condition here we only have to consider two options so that'll make this quicker. Okay, now uh, this function definitely must have ones in cell one, cell five, and cell seven. So this is zero, one, two, excuse me, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And so again, one, five, and seven over here. But in the case on the left, notice that we have the don't care condition for cell 3. So in the case on the left we'll leave cell 3 blank and in the case on the right we'll put a 1 in cell 3. And now uh, let's go ahead and find the uh, simplest SOP expression for G in both of these cases. Well the case here on the left we've already done. So we might as well use our previous work. See, that was done right here. That was, in fact, that was what we found to be the simplest expression uh, for the previous problem. And so it was B prime C or AC. So we'll go ahead and use that work. H of A, B, C is equal to B prime C or A, C. And as we said before, this has four literals. So we didn't have to work, do any work for that. One. But let's now look at this um, second pr uh, possibility. Well, if we, since we're looking for the simplest sum of products uh, expression, we need to look for the prime implicants first. There are no rectangular groupings of eight cells, but there is a rectangular grouping of four cells right here in the middle. So I'll sketch this, and uh, if you look at that for a moment and try to figure out the name, you see that um, A is changing, so it will not appear in the name. B is also changing, so it will not appear in the name, and we only have C. That's the name of that prime implicant. And uh, then if we look for essential prime implicants, well, Every one of these one cells is, in fact, an essential one cell. So our uh, one prime implicant that we have is indeed an essential prime implicant. And now for the minimal sums, we just have uh, H of A, B, C equals C. And that's it. We're done because that accounts for all of the one cells in the problem. And we see that here, we have only one literal. So in this case, choose um, H to be zero for the don't care condition so uh, you can't always uh, assume 
uh, that the that you, that you should choose all don't care conditions to be zero. That will not always. Although in the first problem, that did yield the simplest possibility. In this problem, it did not. So the question now that probably is coming to your mind is, in these problems when we have don't care conditions, do we have to consider all of the possibilities like this? I mean, that, that can get pretty tedious. Suppose that we had a function with, uh, with three don't care conditions. Then if we considered all of the possibilities for each of those don't care conditions, we'd have to do eight Carnot map problems to find the simplest expression for that function and that's obviously very tedious so what we'll do next time is to answer the question so this is for next time next lecture uh, how do we efficiently handle don't care conditions in kernel maps. And that will be for next time. And now we will consider some problems for this lecture. So now we discuss the problems for lecture 14. Uh, all of the problems are related to this one goal, which is to find, we, it says we want to find all minimal products of the function f of w x y z is equal to w prime x prime z or x y prime z prime or w x prime z. And again, that is all minimal products. So, since we're looking for minimal products, of course, uh, you should start by finding all the prime implicates, and then all of the essential prime implicates, and then finally all of the minimal products. And in 14.1, uh, you need to list all of the prime implicates that you find. It should be one of these four options. And number two, you should list all the essential prime implicates that you find, and it should be one of these four options. And finally, uh, in 14.3, you should list all of the minimal products of the function, and that should be one of these four options. Uh, a min uh, notice that one minimal product is given in option A and in option B, and in option C and D. Uh, in both of those, we have two minimal products given. So the, that's the end of those problems, and uh, that concludes Lecture 14. Good luck.